Okay. And this is the awkward part where we wait for people to come in. So welcome all. Okay. I think we can get started. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Ziegler, Director of the ULCC Library and Archives. On behalf of our hosts, the ULCC Library Committee and Literary Subcommittee, welcome to our Cocktails and Conversations with Chicago Authors series, tonight featuring Julia Fine and Kate Weisel. The ULCC Library is proud to support Chicago's vibrant literary community by promoting new and established Chicago authors. We also encourage you to purchase your books from local independent bookstores. Julia and Kate's books are available through the bookseller in Lincoln Square, where signed copies of the Upstairs House are available. Julia and Kate will be happy to answer questions during the last part of our program. So please type your questions into the Q&A anytime during the program. We will try to get to as many as possible. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our authors. Julia Fine is a graduate of Columbia College Chicago's MFA program and is the author of tonight's book, The Upstairs House, recently released in February, 2021. The Upstairs House has been described as macabre and funny, spooky and soulful, bonkers and provocative. And I can personally attest that this book is all this and more. Julia is no stranger to the weird in our world. Her debut novel, What Should Be Wild, is a darkly magical part fairy tale, part coming of age story that was shortlisted for the 2018 Bram Stoker Superior First Novel Award and the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Award. She is a 2014 Lumen Arts Fellow in Creative Writing and was the summer 2015 writer in residence at the Union League Club Library. Julia teaches writing in Chicago where she lives with her husband and children and is a core faculty member at Story Studio Chicago. Kate Weisel is the author of Driving in Cars with Homeless Men, winner of the 2019 Drew Hines Literature Prize, selected by Min Jin Lee. Her fiction has appeared or is forthcoming in publications that include Prairie Schooner, Gulf Coast, Tin House Online, Los Angeles Review, New Ohio Review, the Best Small Fictions 2019, Reed Divider as winner of the Beacon Street Prize and, everywhere, and elsewhere. She lives in Chicago where she teaches at Columbia College Chicago and Loyola University. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. Well, being there with us here. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna step back and turn the program over to you all. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you, Kate, for doing this. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to start by reading a little bit, um, and I'll sort of give a bit of context about the book first. Um, Cheryl had asked, how do I describe this book? And I said, don't worry, I'll take it on, because um, it is a little tricky to describe. Um, the Upstairs House is about a woman who has just had a baby in the opening pages of the book, um, Megan who um, is sort of unprepared to be a mother. Um, she hears sounds from the upstairs of her condo building that nobody else can hear and is either being haunted by the ghost of Margaret Wise Brown, the children's writer, who is building a house, a summer home for her female lover, Michael Strange, uh, or Megan, the protagonist, is experiencing postpartum psychosis. Um, and it's not clear which <laughs> until you get to the end and even then, you know, no spoilers. Um, I'm gonna read a bit from the beginning though, which is sort of just, there's really not much to know. Um, Megan and her husband are sort of preparing for the baby, uh, Solly is their dog and Clara is the baby. Before the baby was my body getting ready for the baby, a preparation both physical, swollen ankles, leg cramps, nausea, and mental. I worried about everything. What if the fumes from the carpet cleaner in the condo next door came through the vents in our bathroom and poisoned our daughter? What if she was born with some new genetic disorder that they couldn't catch with prenatal tests? 
What if the dog hated the baby and we had to get rid of the dog? What if the dog attacked the baby while we weren't looking and we had to have the dog put down? And then the neighbors got mad because they all loved Solly and they tried to kick us out of the condo association for being bad parents and bad dog parents and who would want to live next door to those. They would understand, said Ben, when at eight months pregnant, I played out this scenario. In the incredibly unlikely event that our dog turns vicious and attacks our newborn, I'm sure that everyone will understand why we have to get rid of her. Solly was splayed on the floor next to the couch and he reached down to scratch between her ears. But I don't want to get rid of Solly. Then good thing we don't have to. I feel like you're not taking me seriously. I feel like you're not being serious. My face fell, then softened. Everyone has babies, he said, which wasn't true. People have babies all the time. We're in one of the best cities in the world and we have the best doctors. There's nothing to worry about. None of this was true. If we had stayed in New York or moved to Paris, maybe then at least some of it would be true. But after 15 years away, we'd moved back to Chicago, 40 minutes from Ben's parents, 25 from mine. What are you so scared of? I don't know. If I let myself linger, and I tried very hard not to, I did know. What scared me was the being known, the knowing. This baby would forever be bound to me. How would I hide myself from a part of myself? I knew my own mother in ways that I hoped my daughter would never know me. I pitied my own mother and never wanted to be pitied. I'd seen my mother's C-section scars and her sweat stains, knew the smell that she left in the bathroom. I'd heard her ugly laugh and seen her swear at wait staff and watched her cry in the dark at our old kitchen table after spilling her fourth glass of wine. Motherhood was not a role I envied. It was not a job I wanted, but I didn't not want it either. I didn't actively push it away. We hadn't been trying for a baby. I could have hidden the news from Ben and handled everything discreetly, but I didn't. There was a piece of myself I wanted to cultivate, a version of myself I wanted to be. I could pack sack lunches and bring Gatorade to soccer practice, make trifold science fair projects and polish tiny toenails. I could set aside the dissertation that had started to bore me. Best of all, I barely had to do anything. I could choose without actively choosing. Here was my body, letting us know that we could have this thing, this future, if we wanted it. I could make something of myself, a literal second self, a, li a second living, breathing someone who would need me. I supposed it would be nice to be needed. If I went to the clinic, I would bleed. If it was just a pill, just a needle, just a quick anesthetic, I thought I might've done it, but I didn't want to bleed. Bleeding would have been too messy. Too obvious a metaphor. I was an academic and I lived in a world of eternal incubation. Always one more semester, one more grant. To bleed would have commemorated finality, an active commitment for which I was not dispositionally prepared. So Clara was born. Thank you, Julia. Um, my friend Sarah and I have been talking about this book for weeks. We're in a oh. writing group and we have been urging our, our fellow group members to read this book because it is so good. It's so Thank smart you. and it has so much momentum and is so surprising and original. So congratulations. Thank you. I wanted to ask you some questions. Um, I had a lot of questions and <laughs> apologies in advance because my questions are so long-winded and I try to to edit them and cut them down but I just have so many so much to say um I my first question was about the structure of the book because it's so impressive it's structurally so multi-layered there's a story within a story within a story the narrator's at once realistic yet surreal experience with, with new motherhood framed inside of an ongoing research dissertation that she's like actively writing as she goes that we're privy to, framed inside the context of the more immersive world of a children's book um, in the past of Margaret Wise Brown, the children's book writer, all while enacting a completely suspenseful ghost story 
there's a way in which the book is an interactive journey for the reader to partake in. And I was recently reading um, Aristotle, who said that the best moments of recognition occur when the reader can stitch together meaning along with the character. And you've achieved this on multiple levels. How did you first start constructing the book? And when did you realize that the narrator, narrative was so multidimensional? So I guess maybe a more simple way of asking this could have been like, where did you start? Did you start with being curious about Margaret Wise Brown or did you start like telling this story about a young mom who was unprepared, like you said, for new motherhood? Yeah, um, so the book, it is divided into sections, um, some of which are Megan, the narrator's uh, thesis. She's getting her PhD in history and she's writing about modern, uh, modernist slash modern children's literature um, of which Margaret Wise Brown is a part. And so um, there are excerpts throughout the book of that dissertation. And then as she sort of becomes more immersed in um, sort of the ghostly world of Margaret Wise Brown, her thesis sort of takes on, um, becomes less recognizable sort of as a thesis and becomes more, like Kate said, surreal and bizarre. Um, and yeah, I knew, I started this whole thing um, fairly soon after my son was born. I felt like I had not really read all that many books about the immediate postpartum period. And it was something um, a, lot, a lot of my friends who had also recently had babies felt equally sort of alone and equally um, unprepared, I guess, uh, for exactly what it would be like. So I felt like, okay, well, this is something that I can contribute and write a book that takes place in this period. Um, and I felt immediately too, okay, this can be sort of a horror-esque novel or psychological suspense because in the immediate postpartum period, you're the only one awake in the middle of the night, you're sort of up is down and down is up and you're feeding a baby at all hours. And it's just such a um, shock to the system and you're sort of in a whole new world anyway that I figured I might as well sort of push that to its extreme. Um, at the same time that I was thinking about that, thinking, you know, I would write like Rear Window, but with a nursing mom instead of Jimmy Stewart with a broken leg. Um, but at the same time, I was reading Goodnight Moon to my son um, pretty regularly as sort of his sleep cue to get him to go to sleep. Um, and I just fell more and more in love with it. And I had read it a hundred times and I was still interested. And so I thought, oh, who wrote this book? I guess I should go find out. And as soon as I started to research Margaret Wise Brown, I knew that I wanted to write about her as well. Um, she was just so fascinating and so different from what I had expected. I sort of had thought, okay, she wrote books about bunny rabbits and these are children's classics. She probably was like kind of old and boring and someone's grandmother and it's so, she was so different from that. I mean, she was bisexual. She died very young. Um, she was quirky, sort of to the extreme and kind of an annoying way of, you know, filled her house with flowers and didn't have a refrigerator at her summer home. And, you know, um, just there were so many interesting anecdotes. And so I felt like if I could combine writing about her into this new motherhood book, which would make sense in that, you know, Goodnight Moon is a staple for new parents um, and has been for years, you know, how I sort of was like, I want to write both of these books. How am I going to sort of mash them together? And so it was a lot of trial and error and a lot of, um, you know, trying to figure out what would work, what information from Megan's thesis about Margaret you needed to know in order to understand sort of this haunting. Um, and so it, I sort of hit upon this idea of the dissertation after trying a lot of things that didn't really work. Um, I think that answers your question. <laughs> no, I'm just so, because what was so interesting to me too is like, I was so, I was equally as engaged with the segments about Margaret Wise Brown, which surprised me because I don't read a lot of historical fiction. And mm -hmm. like the, my fascination with Margaret Wise Brown was like, I was equally as interested in her story as what was happening with Megan. And I think, it not only speaks to your writings, it's so like active and maybe I don't think of historical fiction as being as like engaging like that, but because she was such an interesting person too, and mm -hmm. such a surprising person. 
but also I'm thinking about like how well new motherhood in this sense like lends itself to the horror genre and oh, yeah. <laughs> like I was so I'm not a mom but I I felt like so comforted for some strange reason while reading it and maybe that's because of the whole like Hitchcock thing where it's like what's what's um in the closet is scarier than like seeing what the monster is and so I feel like like motherhood is this like such an elusive thing that we don't we don't know or we can't know until we experience it and so in some ways I was like really comforted reading about the like how it can feel like a, like a terror some in I felt comforted by that which is yeah really well, I think, I think you're right. Like, obviously you can't know what it's like until you experience it by virtue of like, you know, you can't have any experience, but I also feel like as a society, as, as a modern society, we really under prepare women for the physical and the psychological toll that it takes immediately after. Like, there's a lot of things you can read about how to parent your child and a lot of information about sort of the nuts and bolts of caring for a baby, but there's not a ton um, to sound sort of super sappy about like caring for yourself or about how to care for new mothers. Um, and it was, I mean, I, I remember the night before my son was born, or maybe it was like right before when I was super pregnant and really uncomfortable thinking like, oh, just get this baby out of me and I'll feel so good. And I just had no I don't know, I didn't realize that you still look pregnant for several weeks afterwards because, you know, the baby is only a little part of what's going on in there. Um, and I didn't know, like, I didn't understand that it would be such a, like the, the birth, no matter how you do it, is a physical trauma and your body recovers. And it also more, even more importantly, I mean, they're both important, but the bigger sort of trauma is the mental transition of suddenly having another human being that you have to care for at its most like helpless stage. Um, and so I think, yeah, I the, the goal with the book obviously was to tell the story, um, but I also, I hope that mothers at all phases, but particularly those who've like recently had children or recently become mothers can read it and sort of feel like their experience is validated and also like their experience is okay. Because again, there's, we get so much culturally about how, you know, it's so lucky and great to have a baby and it is lucky and great to have a baby and people try so hard to have babies. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not hard and it doesn't mean that there aren't sort of like that women don't have postpartum depression or that people don't feel overwhelmed. And I think being like making room for both those things to be okay at the same time is so important. And so I, would hope that, you know, in, in also attempting to be multiple genres, um, I, I hope the message that people take away from the book, regardless of how you felt about the main character or sort of how, what decisions you would have made is that like, it is, it's possible to love your kid and be super overwhelmed or be depressed or, you know, need, need to reach out for help um, after having a baby. Yeah, it felt like a knowledge is power kind of thing where I felt like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is so useful because you hear like, you hear all, you, you hear that it's hard and that's a word that comes up a bunch, but it's like, what does that look like? And yeah. how does that manifest? And what is that really? And so I feel like it's so well illustrated in the book. Um, my second question is that fitting into a kind of schema is a major theme in the book. The idea that there's a mold to be fit of womanhood or motherhood and this goes back to the idea that the, um, actually that the book poses that a family is an object unmovable when really all people move towards and away from each other on a continuum. And as the book points out, objects have a kind of consciousness. And if objects are real, they can tell us something about who we are and who we can become. This is right material for ghost stories because our ideas of ourselves in relation to our families are always changing. I was wondering if there are ghost stories that you have either read or are aware of that informed your writing. Mm. And I guess, who's that writer that says all stories are ghost stories? Is that? Oh. Um, I know the quote, I couldn't tell you who it is. <laughs> Anna, but, but I meant to write that in there that all stories are ghost stories, but this one in particular. 
yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think all, I agree, all stories are ghost stories. And I think all sort of trans, transition stories are about, about like sort of coming into a new phase of your life are like necessarily haunting because there's always who you were and who you are. Um, I, The Turn of the Screw, Henry James was a big inspiration for this book, um, mostly because it walks that line of what is what's happening, what's actually happening, or is this happening in somebody's head? Um, so I was really interested in a ghost story, less as a like sort of figure in a sheet jumping out to say boo, and more as sort of something in the past that has returned. Um, and the, the sort of the line between um, madness and ghost stories, I guess. Um, and then about, so, for objects to go back, I know that wasn't deliberately your question, but this gives me the opportunity to talk about Goodnight Moon, which is all I want to talk about. Um, so like Goodnight Moon, I it's it gets a decent amount of flack, I think, from your like lay person reader because it literally is just a list of objects. You know, like you go around the room and you say goodnight, it's like the balloon and the picture and the chairs and the mittens and there's cats in the room too. You know, all the things that are in the room, they say goodnight. And it's become such a parody of like, well, what else could be in the room that we can say goodnight to and do a Zoom call or do Trump or whatever it is, you know. Um, but it it's such a deliberate setup and it's not like, you know, Margaret Wise Brown dashed off one day, like what things that can I see that I can have my kids say goodnight to? Like it, it really, it sets up sort of a sense of comfort because you get the objects and then you get the objects repeated and they're sort of everyday childhood things that sort of give children a sense of place. Um, and the fact that she then goes into sort of good night air, good night noises and outside of the room is its own thing. Um, and that's sort of a very particularly Margaret Wise Brown thing, but the tradition that she sort of started and is drawing on here of books being about everyday experiences and sort of like, a, a, a book for young children being just a list of things a young child can see and how that sort of gives them a sense of self and a sense of comfort and routine. Um, and so I found that so interesting and it sort of stems from, you know, the progressive early education um, movement of sort of the early 20th century, which Margaret was uh, a student at the Bank Street School for Teachers like teacher's college and ended up not being that great at teaching preschool, but clearly very good at writing books. And she was very prolific. Um, but it was this, this idea that instead of saying, you know, once upon a time for a two-year-old, you say, you know, good night moon, good night noises. Um, and that resonates with them. And that, you know, is a book that they can read and understand in a way that what was previously given to children or you know, nothing was given to children. Um, before that. And so I was really interested. This is a long way of saying I was interested in how to apply that concept sort of for adults. And in a way, there's modernism, you know, there's like Gertrude Stein and James Joyce and Juna Barnes and modernist writers, uh, all of whom Margaret was really influenced by. Um, but I also thought it was so interesting to think like as adults, how we interact with the objects in our lives and how somebody who sort of feels untethered in her personal life, um, even before having a baby, might sort of cling to categories and objects and sort of ways to anchor herself to the world or to a specific reality. And so I was trying, I mean, my goal, I really was like, how do I write Good Night Moon for adults? So I'm really glad that you picked up on sort of some of these ideas. Yeah, well, there was also this section too, you're reminding me of, of when, um, I think it was Margaret Wise Brown that introduced like the concept of having like tangible books and like touching and yeah yeah like the sensory you know, or, aspect of it mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and then that kind of moves into another one of my questions that I had which is um, the way in which the book interrogates the power of language which seems like like some phrase that we always hear, but it actually does on a literal level mm -hmm. um, to name and therefore transform. So like if you could name something, you can, um, it can become something else. It worked on both an intuitive level and also a cerebral and intellectual level. I was wondering what some of your favorite words are and um, always been attracted to breaking down the etymology of words to their origins or to their like core usages because that was like an adjacent element of the book that I enjoyed so much was like I think I feel like I learned like 
700 new words, not just the words, but like their origins and their, huh. and, and, and like thinking about that made me think about how powerful naming things actually is. Yeah, so I mean, that definitely, I think the, in, in this context, the initial thought came out of that same sort of idea of like good night moon is so, it's so simple. So like, how can you not necessarily complicate it, but like, how can you dig deeper? So like, okay, well, what would the origin sort of what, how do you unpack and sort of like peel the layers off of these words? And then what do they mean? And like, is there, the other thing I was really interested in um, that I think, I'm not sure how much of it made it into the final book, but in very early drafting, I was very interested in sort of like, okay, like how do you like distill the truth, you know, of something? And so I felt like, okay, if you like, you know, keep digging down into these etymologies, like how do you find what something truly means? And I think the reason that it perhaps didn't, uh, it sort of, it sort of ended up. So Megan is a, um, the, the protagonist is a, a history student. And so like her, at one point she sort of is like, I, I felt like what I could do is like, look up what was true and sort of reconstruct it and have like objective truth. And she sort of realizes over the course of this experience, this isn't really giving anything away. Cause I think as adults, we all come to this conclusion at some point um, that there's just no such thing as objective truth. And that even if you read like say a biography of Margaret Wise Brown, if she showed up on your, you know in your stairwell you wouldn't necessarily know her all that much better just cause you know sort of the facts of her life. Um, etymology though so this is that was spun me off a little bit um but yeah so I was using etymology at that point and I think I also at a certain point had a really I was really enjoying looking up <laughs> the, the origins of words and I was really it really struck me how many of the words that I use just like how many commonplace words have these deeper meanings that seem to fit really well with the book, um, like careful was one where um, it's an old, it comes sort of, one of its origins is in old English, like a careful bed, which was a sick bed. And so I thought that was just so interesting. And I was interested in how we used it um, and how we use language. And again, like the big tie-in obviously is as a children's author, Margaret Wise Brown's books, what is it like 50 words in all of Good Night Moon and then they all repeat. And so each word has to be so particular and each word has to be the perfect word. And reading about her writing process too, I realized like that was what she did. You know, she would go back and forth with her editor over, you know, one word in this hundred word manuscript. Um, and so I felt like, okay, well, I am also going to do that. And it just led me down a really interesting path. Yeah. And with the dissertation, it's, there was a way in which uh, midway through it, it became like Megan wasn't writing the dissertation anymore to like impress her um, thesis advisor or to like get it right. But it was like this, it was going to save her or it was going to show her something that she needed to see either about herself reflected in Margaret. Um, so I just, I love the way that kept changing. Yeah, I, I mean, I also, one of, one of the things that I think a lot of books about parenthood end up addressing is sort of how you balance your sort of the, the life of the mind with the actual like practical day-to-day -day taking care of small children. Um, and that was something that I really wanted Megan's work to sort of embody that journey and that sort of grasp at who she was before having a baby. Yeah. There's a fear of intimacy that pervades the pages in a really glorious way. And I mean, in some ways it, well, anyways, now, now I'm like adding more questions to my questions. No, I like that. I love how this is so, it, it feels like such a conversation I'm, and I have my cocktails. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Julia. Mm. The danger of being known, of being replicated, and there's a demand the narrative constantly makes that the unknown must be let in. This feels like a larger question that extends past even new motherhood. We're all in some ways scared of the unknown. And I guess this goes back to my like Hitchcock 
question, but were you aware of this as a major theme in the book? I mean, I'm sure because <laughs> it has this like really moving backstory about her mom and growing up and um, her mom sort of falling apart and then coming back together again and their like precarious relationship. And I think it just like animates this like more general fear that like having a kid can um, reflect you in some way that they're a mirror of you. And that to Megan is really terrifying, which is really interesting because I hadn't really thought about it in that way before. Like, wow, it's not just like, oh, this, my child looks so much like me. We can wear it, like dress up as like, like we look like twins, but it's like really this scary notion that your child is like ref somehow reflective of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's sort of this, the social and the biological, like the sort of nature nurture aspects of it. And I think a lot of, I mean, in general, and I think this is a very, just like women in general live in fear of judgment or live not, not even in fear, but like with the specter of judgment all the time. And especially mothers of, you know, are you doing this right? Or are you doing this wrong? Um, so for to not Megan, like she doesn't really have an example of sort of a mother who like she didn't have a nurturing mother herself. And so how does she know to provide it? Um, and then also when it comes to like postpartum mood disorders and any sort of um, mental health, it, a lot of it is genetic and hereditary. And one of the biggest sort of risk factors of something like postpartum psychosis is did your mother experience something like this or do you have, you know? Um, and so that to me is really interesting as well. Cause we like to think, you know that we pass down like the best to our children but there's also the biological just like you can't know what like there's, you can, you can do your best to not give them your own issues, you know but it biologically they're, they're something, you know, is going to come through as well. So I was really interested in, in that. And I was also interested in how somebody who, like you said, has sort of kept people at arm's length and has um, steered away from intimacy, even with her husband, um, sort of on a, on a real sort of um, like, obviously they are physically intimate, but emotional intimacy. Um, what, what it means then when you have a baby who's just on you all the time and the, there is no border like the the line between you and your kid when they're that age there just isn't one you know and so um I think that was something that I had been really struck by uh, when becoming a parent and then it became sort of a baby how, how is a baby going to sort of take these cracks that are already in this sort of self that you've built and like just like burst through them, which I think is what ends up happening to Megan in this book, is like every, all, all of the different sort of fortresses that she's built up that allow her to move through the world are suddenly just like busted open with this baby. And she is totally unequipped to either build it back up herself or really to like reach out and have someone help her. Yeah, the physicality is so shocking. <laughs> like it, like you, feel that proximity at all times. Like if the baby's not on Megan literally, then we're like aware of where the baby is in the mm -hmm. room and it creates this like constant friction and constant sense of like being rattled or needed or used or um, like even Clara just eating Megan's hair. <laughs> like, like her body is just so dispensable. Um, and then I also was reminded just as you were talking of the way in which like there were some amazing images of Clara being like just a lot of like religious symbolism like she, at one point she has her hand up like she's testifying or Megan spills marinara sauce on her and it's like she's being baptized with the marinara <laughs> and there was really good just really like original fresh lines about Clara and I was wondering if those were intentional too, because Ooh, the religious stuff, not so much. <laughs> um, the, I mean, I, I did make, I mean, there's, hmm. I guess it's, I'm 
trying to think how to phrase it because it's not really a religion, but so Margaret Wise Brown's mother was a theosophist or was into theo theosophy, um, which is sort of was this like spiritualist craze among the sort of upper middle class um, in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. And as such, like Margaret was not especially religious and Michael Strange, her lover was not especially religious. But then when um, Michael, so Michael Strange was diagnosed with cancer in her late fifties and basically had, you know, several years to deteriorate and know that she was going to die. Um, and became super interested then in like spiritualism. So I was interested in religion. I mean, I guess, I guess when you say it that way, you could look at it as like a contrast between like the physical world where there's like real, not to say that theosophy isn't a real religion, although I don't think it really is. Um, but yeah, so there, I, I, was, I was actively interested in that contrast and in what sort of turned somebody like Michael Strange who had been very like, this is all BS to Margaret, like your mom is crazy effectively. And then all of a sudden later in her life at like, you know, last grasp of like, what if I could be reincarnated, you know? Um, so that I was interested in. And that was actually true. Like she actually, um, there are letters sort of between them talking about both of those things. Um, so kind of maybe, I don't know. I like your read though. <laughs> um, okay, now let's get ready for a really long question. I'm so sorry about this. Um, the narrator goes to the upstairs house. So Julia had like described the upstairs house being an actual place above um, their, the family's apartment. Um, when she wants time away from the unbearable pressures of her own life, but in a way the time in the upstairs house brings her closer to her inner reality, a liminal space between being a daughter and a mother and a woman and a world whose aim is to diminish and silence our intuition and power. When the reader questions the reality of Margaret's existence, we're afforded the opportunity to understand just how easy it is to label or silence a woman. Margaret acts as a way for the narrator to examine herself and exercise in self-recognition. In this way, Margaret moves beyond the symbolic. And I hesitate to use the word empowering because I now feel like it's become like a capitalist tool. <laughs> that is being turned against us, but uh -huh. in a sense, Margaret truly empowers the narrator to move beyond who she thinks she should be and into a less contained or neat definition of self and identity. Um, and I'm realizing that there's no question here, <laughs> but I was just so interested in like the idea of building a house. And it reminded me of, of course, like a room of one's own. And, mm -hmm. um, and how did you, make the decision to to have Margaret actually be building this house instead of like how did it occur to you to like sync up those two things that she's so, building upstairs because yeah. there, she becomes like a babysitter like she's like actually fully functioning in the book as a person mm -hmm. so the house is again based on um so Margaret Wise Brown had a cabin in Maine that she would go to in the summers. And it had, it was very, I mean, it was very typical Margaret, like there was no refrigerator and she would keep her milk in the stream. And it, you know, she had like her mirror out on the front lawn and um, she, it was like covered in, she was really into fur. And so it was all like fur carpets and fur chairs. And she would cut her chairs off like at the, so that they'd be lower to the ground. So like the chair legs were only half, it's just very weird. Um, and not like the most, it wasn't like a not, a not welcoming space, but for someone who like enjoyed her creature comforts, like Michael Strange, it was not the most welcoming place. And so Margaret always wanted to go to her summer cabin and then Margaret, her lover, who they were in this on again, off again relationship that was like fairly toxic. Um, but Michael would be like, I don't wanna go to Maine with you in that weird house. Um, and so Margaret was like, okay, well, we should build you your own house. And so she never actually, um, she never, you know, to the best of our knowledge, never was like up there with a hammer herself building a house for Michael. Um, but there are, there are letters between the two of them where Margaret is like, okay, I'd like to do this. And she like looked into actually like, can I acquire this property for her so that she can have somewhere more comfortable because, you know, she just wants to stay in a five-star hotel um, mm -hmm. and not in my little cabin, but I want her up here with me in the summer. And so I just was 
struck by how much that seemed to like embody their relationship, um, which then I was interested and in, like, it's a bit of a stretch, but sometimes not of like how I was interested in finding the parallels between sort of that relationship between Margaret and Michael and the relationship between Megan and Clara. Um, and so it sort of felt like, okay, you build something new for this new part of yourself that like isn't necessarily comfortable. Um, and so there was that. And then the title, um, my editor actually came up with, I, when I what wrote was, the book, it was called Good Night Nobody, um, I which I really liked, but there was another book called Good Night Nobody. And it's a direct quote from Good Night Moon, which is becomes like a sticky situation. Um, and my editor said, I don't think that that's the best title for this book. Um, and so she gave me just sort of a list of things that she liked. And this was on there. And I was like, this is so perfect because it's about the physical house, but it's also about sort of the, the mental, um, like sort of the, the experience of trying to keep your intellectual life active after having a baby um, and about sort of mental health and about so many different things. Um, and then I got like the pretty little house on the cover. So it all, yeah, it all worked out nicely, but the house was a really, it was a way for me to almost access Margaret because I was like, I can see, I mean, we've all done things for somebody that we're in love with who is kind of mean to us, right? Like we can build them a house. Um, and so that was a really nice way in. Awesome. Um, I don't know if we want to open it up to audience questions. I can keep, I can keep going. Um, I mean, I don't know, Sh Cheryl, are you still there? Yeah, why don't, why don't you go ahead and um, if you have one more and then we'll, mm -hmm. we'll go into audience questions. Yeah. Um, okay. What is it like with coming out with your second book during and having everything be virtual and I I mean obviously it's not ideal because you don't get the same sort of sense of community at a virtual event where like afterwards you're just like alone with a blank computer um, but it also has been kind of nice because people all around the country have been able to pop into things and I think it's made literary events more accessible when people aren't totally exhausted um I mean, it's, it's not ideal, but it, I also feel very lucky that I'm like at the tail end, fingers crossed, of the pandemic um, and not sort of in those first few weeks when everyone had to pivot and like people who had books out in April, I don't even know how, I mean, they, it just so much fell between the cracks there, I think. Um, so if it has to be in a pandemic, I feel like February and March, 2021 is the time um, and then hopefully for the paperback, I'll get to, you know, go places and see people. Um, but things like this have been so lovely and like talking to you is so wonderful. So I really can't complain. Yes. Let's see. Um, okay. Stephanie wants to know what else you would like people to know about Margaret or Michael that either didn't end up with the book or that you just want to talk about more. <sighs> What do I want people to know? I mean, I think for Margaret, especially, just because it it's so easy to read her books and think, oh, you know, this is somebody writing books for children. And I'm just sitting here reading these to my kid to get them to go to bed and not really like engaging with them as an adult. Um, but I think when you learn more about her, her work becomes more interesting. Like she was a really avid rabbit. Hunter, she was a member of a beagling club on Long Island where they would go, you know, back when Long Island was more mansions and rich people and sort of fields than it is today. Um, they would go and like go hunting and have these weekend long hunting parties. And she was in a club for it and was really into it. Um, and like, so she wrote books. I, I, it just, I, it's fascinating to me that like, you know, she wrote The Runaway Bunny and she also like would go hunting for bunnies. Um, and she, there were just a lot of aspects of her that sort of don't quite gel with what makes sense, um, in a really interesting way. Um, she's like a box of contradictions. Like I know she's so contradictory. She's so interesting. And she, it's interesting too, because it's very clear that like the, who she presented herself as to, um, 
you know, the, the children's book community, like she was very, she gave like a, a, she gave a famous interview that gets picked up a lot. Um, so if you Googled her and were to find like a listicle about her, it'd be like, she hated kids, you know, and that's not true, but she did give a tongue in cheek interview where she was like, I don't really care much for children. They're, I want to treat them like adults, but smaller, you know? Um, but she was just, she was sort of like, she's funny and she was quirky and kind of glamorous and, um, super interesting and when you read her books again sort of with the eye for the fact that she was a huge fan of Gertrude Stein um and that she you know would was coming up in this new field of sort of experimentally testing children's books on children to see how they would respond and changing a word that a kid didn't respond to um and sort of re, re really reconceptualizing what books for small children could be um, it, it just all becomes so much more than like that book where you just say the good night to the things over and over, whichever book it is. Um, and she has a lot of really weird, good, good ones too, that are not necessarily part of the canon, um, where you can like see the real weirdness come through, which I really love. I also was wondering, um, I read some, somewhere that you finished editing this book, I think like the night before your daughter was born. Oh yeah. Yes. How did you write... Cause I know you have a son. What, what, what is your like writing process like? And just how, how did you write this second book? So this, yeah, I, I mean, my daughter is eight months old now and I finished like the first pass pages, which is where they um, like basically put the text into like, it's formatted how it's going to look on the page of the actual book and you go through and you find anything. So I finished, it was like the, the tail end of the editing process. Um, and I was supposed to have three and a half weeks. And then my daughter was like, nope, here I am. Um, like literally the night before it was very, it was almost like my body was like, okay, I can relax now. Um, but for, in terms of writing, I, everything has been thrown out the window this year. Um, I was writing with you uh, when my son was at school and I would write during nap times and it all, I mean, I, I really admire anybody who has been able to do any work this past year. Um, so I'm hopeful that I'll get into more of a routine, but it is really hard. And it took me almost a full year um, for my son to sort of be on a regular schedule and for my brain to feel a little bit less fried um, to write this book. So I would say, I mean, it definitely wasn't a case of like, I had a baby and I immediately started writing about it. Like I took like basically a year off and I've now taken another year off. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, <laughs> but. I'm also wondering, cause we write, um, we would meet up to get coffee and write. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if like that, if that's, you have like a consistent schedule or if it's- Not yeah. right now, no. I'm hoping to get one again. Um, that is the only way I think in which I am capable of writing a book. Um, so hopefully, I mean, I, Childcare is like within reach. Um, and so I think that's just gonna be a game changer for me. Um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's much less. It's funny because I feel like before I had kids, it was more about like, oh, what do I write about? Like I, you know, there's the the world, there's so much to do and the, the it's about making sort of that decision. And now it's just about time and, you know. I, yeah, I heard like a, I think a friend of mine who has a baby said it's almost easier because when the baby naps, that's when she writes and it's mm -hmm. easier to like be under that constraint. Oh my God. Yes. A lot of sense. <laughs> well, yeah. And you, and you can't waste time too in the way that you can before where you're like, what if I research for a few hours? Like, no, if I don't do it now, it's not going to get done. So hopefully I'll return to that someday. <laughs> I think um, we have another question. Um, you haven't talked about Megan's husband at all. What is your take on him? Mm -hmm. um, he's a funny tertiary, tertiary character because he's, he almost, um, he, his inaction is almost more interesting to watch. Like if, if that makes sense, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think he, is clearly the wrong partner for Megan. And she sort of knows that too and acknowledges that right away. Um, and so I think that's like part of then why it's so hard for anyone around her. Cause like part of the book too is like the people around her sort of being unable to help her or not knowing that they should be helping her. Um, and he sort of is a main culprit here. Um, 
And I definitely, I mean, I don't like see him as representing every dad or as like, you know, like no men are helpful, but I do think sort of it, it probably is pretty typical if again, like, you know, they haven't been especially intimate emotionally in your marriage after you have a baby, it's not like a baby is going to push you. Like I, what was it? My husband and I have said several times, um, and we have a very strong relationship, but we've said like, it's not, you know, people have, you look at all these stories of like, people were like, oh, let's have a baby so that we can stay together. It's like, no, that's the opposite of what it does. Like all it does is intensify all of the issues that you already had because you're just fried, you know? Um, and so one of their issues in their marriage was sort of a lack of emotional connection, um, and sort of a, a smoothing over and a very, um, like surface level emotional relationship. And so I think that's part of it. So as much as he tries to help um, and as much as he sort of tries to be there, if he if she's not letting him in, it's never going to happen. Um, so I have sympathy for him. I don't, I mean, I don't think I would want to be married to him, um, but I definitely don't see him as like, I don't think it's any of it is his fault. And I think he does his best. Um, and I think it's just sort of a situation, a difficult situation that they're in. Yeah, he tries hard. Um, this is an interesting one. Julia wrote an article on how I ruined Good Night Moon for Karen, which is a really funny article and you should read it. Has she had this kind of reaction? Have you had this kind of reaction a lot? Not really, actually. Um, I thought because like early on, there was a like, how could you do this to Margaret Wise Brown? Um, Maybe it's because I got out ahead of it and was like, actually, this is, I didn't do this to her. This is like based on a lot, like I did a ton of research um, and I really tried really, really hard to present, um, to present her like as close to how she might have been as possible. Obviously I can't. A total ode right? to her. Um, what? I thought it was a total ode to her. Oh, I mean, I, I think so. I think it's hard too, because you get, with, with any sort of classic book or like, I don't know, we, we idolize people and we sort of have these images of people in our heads. And so I think it's easy, even with all her like quirkiness, like even if you know some of the details of her life, I think it's still really easy to sort of like put her up on a pedestal or idolize her. Um, and I was really interested in trying to see if I could figure out who she was as a person. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have not, I mean, I'm sure there will be more. Um, I was like with publishing this book, it was sort of the double-edged sword of like both writing pretty graphically about the postpartum experience and sort of tarnishing the name of a beloved children's author. But people have responded really, really well so far. And I think um, for the most part, if you if you read this book and you don't if it's not for you, then it's not for you, but people haven't been like, you know, waving pitchforks in, in a way that they could be, except for one or two people who are like, I thought I would love this book because it's Margaret Wise Brown, but this isn't the Margaret Wise Brown I know. It's like, well, if you read her biography, like I would hope that you would sort of recognize her, you know? So, if anybody has any questions, um, put them in the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to give you all one more reminder. Buy this book. It's an incredible book. Um, it's an incredible read. And I want to thank both of you so much um, for a, a wonderful program. This was very much a conversation. And um, that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, Julia, congratulations on this. I know it's been a hard go with the with with COVID and all that, but um, it's it, it's been really interesting to see you. Okay, this is going to sound goofy. See you grow up. Oh, thank <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> we we do have something else. Um, so I love your book, Julia's Brilliant Writing and Kate's Insightful Interview, Making Tonight's Discussion Delightful. I viewed house as a way of illustrating nurturance and restoration. If a message of your book is the juxtaposition of love, loss, and new identity, do you see it applying to other life experiences? Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I 
I definitely think it can. I, like I said earlier, when Kate was talking about how all stories are ghost stories and sort of all, all sort of transitions, um, like life transitions are hauntings and ghost stories too. I think you can totally apply like anytime. I mean, motherhood is such an obvious transition and there's such a clear before and after and you're such a different person sort of on, on one side of it. But I think there's a lot of experiences that are like that, um, like marriage, moving to a new house, starting school, starting a new job when a parent dies or like a loved one. Um, I just, in general, you know, it's so, I, th I think that we, we forget sometimes like how much we change as people, I guess, when we go through these formative experiences, like we call them formative. Um, so I do think that this book, like it's, obviously it's, you know, very um, immediately about this one particular experience, but I think, you know, any, it, it can apply sort of a lot of the themes and ideas can apply to any sort of big life transition or change. Okay. Well, thank you again to both of you for being here. Um, also, thank you to all attending. Um, if you're not a Union League Club member, please check out our website at www.ulcc.org um, and consider membership with the club. Uh, we're a community that values civic, cultural, and social engagement. And, um, you know, having programs like these is just one of the perks. So, Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks so much.